It's a good thing that when I was a kid, my imaginary friend was the pink Power Ranger. I'll take an evil version of her any day. What is going on everybody and welcome to my review of the newest Blumhouse horror film, Imaginary. And this is one that I walked into absolutely blind. I had only seen the posters, I never watched the trailer, didn't look up a plot synopsis or even who was in the movie. So all I had to go off of was this basically all blue background with a nefarious looking little teddy bear. Didn't know if the teddy bear was gonna come to life or what was gonna go on. And essentially what this movie is about is this little girl that fixates on this little bear named Chauncey Bear. He's her imaginary friend. And her stepmom starts to see some nefarious details that come out of that, some very odd things that come out of that. And unbeknownst to her, there might be some ties to her past. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. Uh, Blumhouse is one of those companies that is a major name as far as the horror genre. They're one of the biggest producers of horror films. For a long time, they were the king, might even still arguably be the king, at having an extremely low budget and walking away with a really nice profit no matter how good the movie was. They pretty much set a brand new template for how to produce films and how to make a profit off of those. And they've made a ton of great movies. There's been some of the best horror films and even some films outside of the horror genre. Blumhouse is responsible for a number of my favorite movies of the past six, seven years. Unfortunately, they're also responsible for some of the worst films that I've seen over the past six or seven years. For every time you get something like The Black Phone, you get a couple of Night Swims and Truth or Dares. And so unfortunately, the name Blumhouse always makes me walk in a little bit guarded. I wish that that was a brand at this point that I could walk in and say, this is gonna be cool, this is gonna be unique, this is gonna be awesome, but I never really know what I'm walking into. So I checked out Imaginary last night. Was it a nice, pleasant surprise? Is it a potential start to a new horror franchise? Franchise, or is this unfortunately another continuation of the rough track record that Blumhouse has had as of late ever since Halloween ends? Um, it's not the first one. Now one might say growing up and leaving your imaginary friends behind means you no longer get to explore your imagination, but what you do get to explore is wine pairings and the regional tastes of each individual bottle. So check out the sponsor of today's video, Bright Cellars. You know, I've always wanted to experiment with different wine pairings when I cook dinner or just enjoy a glass with my wife on the couch as we watch a movie. But I've always been intimidated to walk down the wine aisle and spend a bunch of money buying random bottles with no true understanding of what variations, styles, or even brands of wine that I'll actually like. Well, Bright Cellars is the wine club that makes it easy to learn what you like. Bright Cellars' seven-question quiz matches you with wines that you'll love, and the intimidation of the wine aisle becomes joy and convenience as your selected wines are delivered right to your door. Each box comes with cards to help you learn about the flavor notes, places of origin, and even recommended food pairings for each individual bottle. And the best part is there is zero risk, because if you actually don't like one of the bottles that you're sent, your Bright Cellars concierge will replace it, no questions asked. Bright Cellars is giving my followers their first six bottle subscription box, which is usually over $150 for just 55 bucks. So click the link in the description to take the quiz and get started today. And thank you so much to Bright Sellers for sponsoring today's video. Starting off with the positives for Imaginary, I do really like this concept. I do think that just the general base concept of taking something that a child puts their trust into and corrupting that, there's a lot of potential for that. I mean, my beloved Child's Play franchise is one of the kings, if not the king at that concept. We had Megan from Blumhouse, that's their, their major hit from last year that's certainly playing on that and I was hoping this was going to go along those lines of that of just doing the imaginary friend angle of of that corruption and I was really hoping that imaginary would continue on with that and do something and just in the new angle of the imaginary friend and taking it into a much more supernatural realm than things like child's play or Megan that's slightly more grounded slightly. I mean, hell, you can even go back to the 90s and check out things like Don't Look Under the Bed for all of you DCOM fans out there. And that was a really cool, albeit kid-friendly version of the imaginary friend being corrupted by evil. So there was a lot of potential here. And I, if they did make a profit and they decided to come back for a second one, I actually think there's a lot of potential to do even better with a sequel. There's a lot of cool things you can do when you're just playing in the, the sandbox of a child's imagination. Like there's a sequence in this film that 
to me was almost reminiscent of the third act of Hellraiser 2. And there's so many different things. You have carte blanche, just like with the Nightmare on Elm Street series, when you're in the dream world or the imagination world, carte blanche to do whatever you want, albeit silly or campy or terrifying. And so the concept here, is really cool. The concept has so much potential. I was really intrigued by the character Gloria, who's played by Betty Buckley. She's the older neighbor. Uh, you know, basically the movie kicks off where the the lead character, this woman who's a newly uh, married woman who's a stepmom of two younger kids, moves their family into her childhood home, and the neighbor is this seemingly crazy while also being very warm and welcoming neighbor that knows some things about the main character's past, and so she's kind of the Device that we get a lot of our backstory and uh, some of the device for the exposition of how this the rules of this movie are going to work now they do get a little heavy with the dialogue and I'm gonna get into that later but her character to me struck a really nice balance of being intriguing and being off kilter while also being somewhat comforting like she's somebody that you want to trust and you want to uh, see her kind of be brought into the fold and bring some some protection some comfort to the characters that are in peril and at the same time there's a part of your brain where the alarm bells are ringing going I don't quite know maybe there's something off about her like she just seems so nonchalant about the fact that she knows so much about imaginary friends and the lore that we're going to get into that there's something off with her and i thought that the actress did a nice little balance of quirkiness and finally i thought that piper braun did a pretty good job notably in a few key scenes at, at being a really emotional child actor she's the one who plays alice who is the little girl who is most directly involved with chauncey bear and the the imagination and the the peril that the characters are about to be enduring for the rest of the runtime. And there's a few specific sequences where she has to get really heightened, she has to get emotional, she has to get scared or start breaking down. I thought she did pretty good. I mean, anytime a child actor can nail those emotions, especially in a horror film where they have to keep that emotions going quite a bit and do them quickly, I think it's worthy of praise and I think she did good. Moving out of the mixed, the design of the eventual reveal of Chauncey Bear within the world of the imagination, I think was interesting because there is a certain thing to be said about how a child's imagination always kind of blends the horrifying with the really kooky and child-friendly images. Uh, when they're exposed to media or stories or drawings, like that's kind of their pictures in their mind of what a shark or a bear or a monster is going to look like. And it's inevitably always going to look a little more childish than things like The Thing or, you know, some of the more adult creature feature movies that are definitely meant just to terrify. So I think the design of the bear strikes a balance of that where it's definitely childlike. It's a little bit goofy looking while also having some of the very surface level terrifying aspects, big teeth, giant size that a kid would immediately draw to in their imagination. While I understand the motivation of the design and I didn't dislike it, I, I certainly understood what they were going for. It's not the best execution. I, I don't think that they, they utilized the design of the bear as far as how it's shot or the specific sequences that the design is revealed here and there to its fullest potential. And I think because more adults are going to be seeing this than children, they're going to lean much more harder on how silly it looks versus how maybe realistic this design would be as far as the imagination of a child and what that imagination would probably create. And I honestly think that comes down to the direction. You know, Jeff Wadlow is the director here. I believe he's also the writer. Uh, and he's somebody that I actually like a couple of his films. And it's traditionally when he goes to the action genre. He has a movie called Never Back Down that I saw whenever I was a teenager with some friends of mine and has always been one of my favorites. It's a little melodramatic and hokey at times, but it's a very fun movie. I think the action and the fight scenes are shot well. I've always really liked that one. Kick-Ass 2. Obviously a bit of a downgrade from the first Kick-Ass. I don't think there's many people that would disagree with that, but I still thought Kick-Ass 2 was a really good time. I would not have been upset if Wadlow came back and did an eventual Kick-Ass 3. So I do like some of his movies. His work in the horror genre, however, uh... So clearly this is a guy that I would champion. I think that he has done good work. I would hope to finally see him do something in the horror genre that I would like. So far he, he has not done anything that I have liked, but 
Yeah, I, I just don't know. I think his skills as a director have been much more prevalent in action, and I've, I wish that he would lean more into that, or at least maybe hone what he does so well in action and bring that over to horror, where his directing style in horror just seems to be a, a little off. Like, imaginary, just like Truth or Dare, you have something that should be creepy, and could be creepy if you shot it and framed it and executed it in a certain way, but the way that Wadlow executes it always seems to come across as goofy and corny. I mean, we had Smile that essentially was the same visual gimmick as Truth or Dare, but Smile was genuinely unnerving, where Truth or Dare kind of became a meme. So, Wadlow, nothing but love for what the guy has done in the action genre, to repeat myself for the third or fourth time at this point. I encourage you to check out both those movies if you haven't. I think he needs to figure out what about his directing style and, and focusing on the images that should be creepy is just not working for the audience. And now moving on to the negatives. And by far the biggest issue with this movie for me, the thing that just grated on my nerves about especially the entire second half, is that this film gives Madam Web a genuine run for its money for worst dialogue that I have heard in a very long time. I don't know if the script just didn't get enough passes or what the hell happened here, but anytime you have a movie where most of the dialogue is just spent treating its audience like we're fucking idiots, like everything that is visually happening on screen and is so easy to interpret, the characters find it necessary to just wax away and give us a bunch of dialogue to explain what is happening on screen, and it's like, no fucking shit! What did you think my interpretation of what's going on was going to be? Like, there's a scene where they have to, like, gather things. Like, it's like a child's scavenger hunt, that they have to gather certain things and put them together in this bowl and light it on fire to open the gates to the, uh, the world of imagination. Like, something that burns, something that uh, hurts, something that would get you in trouble. And when the woman stabs her hand for something that hurts and nothing happens, she immediately turns to her stepdaughter and just starts saying the meanest shit possible, which is a stark contrast for how her character has been the entire rest of the film. And we'll get into that. And she actually, the other character finds it necessary once it starts to work to go, oh, the scissors to your hand wasn't actually pain. It needed deeper pain. This is something that hurts. No fucking shit! And it does it so often that it doesn't even feel like actual human beings talking. Like, it just feels like somebody narrating without a voiceover. Like, the character is just narrating in real time what the fuck is happening in this script. And it drove me nuts. Like, it happens a couple of times in the first part of the movie, and you're like, okay, whatever, I'll forgive that. That's lazy writing, but whatever. The second half of the film, as soon as the lore and the craziness and everything is cranked up to 10, it's constant. The other biggest thing that was an issue for me was that I really didn't buy into this family. I didn't buy into most of the characters. They didn't feel real to me. The dialogue is a large reason for that. But like the main character, Jessica here, the woman who is the stepmother to these younger kids that is trying to protect them while also navigating the bitchiness of the teenage daughter and also trying to uncover things about her past that is tied to the current situation going on. This is a character that is written to be so over the top positive and like uh, almost poetic the way that she is saying things to the younger girl primarily that she never feels like a real human being. Like if you're going to put us in this situation that is a very real world situation that happens across families all over the world where it's a broken home, it is a dysfunctional family, you get somebody that is brought in, either a new husband or a new wife, and now they have to kind of regain the, the trust of these kids that have obviously had their faith lost in the divorce of their parents. Like these are all things that we can all relate to in some way, and all of us probably have childhood memories or teenage memories or even memories as an adult being that step-parent that can very easily make us go into the shoes of these characters. But in order for that to happen, they have to act like human beings. Like, okay, the younger girl automatically takes to the older woman and the teenage girl is immediately resistant and bitchy and very disrespectful. 
cool, kind of a trope and kind of a cliche at this point, but that is the way that it happens more times than not. But you have to have the step parent at least react to these two very stark difference of relationships in a way that makes sense. Like if the teenage girl is going to be an absolute bitch and bring a fucking drug dealer into the house and her younger sister has an accident because she's not watching her and things like you have to have a human response to that. And the way that this character Jessica responds to these situations where it's time to actually have some emotion, it's time to actually have some human relation to the situation going on, it just feels so monotone, it feels so toned down, it feels so like almost textbook gentle parenting to like, oh, it's okay, I know that you brought Molly into the house and suddenly my art studio is fucked up and your sister almost got hurt, but we'll talk about this over dinner. Or even the way that she deals with the kid that she has a good relationship with and just every single line of dialogue that she has feels poetic, like she's trying to say something on the back of a fucking self-help book and it's like, Parents don't talk this way. Humans don't talk this way. Who wrote this dialogue? There's a few attempts at plot twists that quite honestly, the main one I saw coming from Jump Street, they don't really do a good job at hiding it. It's one of those things where they try to deconstruct the twist down to little minute details to leave breadcrumbs in the movie, but they deconstruct it too far where the details that they leave are just kind of odd and they stick out like sore thumbs and they make you focus on them way more than you should. And so your brain automatically starts to wonder what the significance of these little weird details are. And then you come to the conclusion very early on in the film. Uh, I don't wanna get too specific, but you know, CB, if you've seen the movie, you understand what I'm talking about? S-E-E-B-E-E, -E -E -E. hmm. Okay. And it also becomes an issue too, where if you deconstruct your twist to the point where it just, it, it kind of lacks logic. Like I'll stick with the CB example. No child would have an issue saying what they're supposed to say and then putting CB on the wall as a way to translate that. Doesn't make any fucking sense. And finally, this is a movie that really hammers home that Blumhouse is beginning to have a template. And that's unfortunate because, you know, for a long time, whether it was great or it was terrible, Blumhouse definitely had a variety to them. And they very much championed having independent directors and first time directors come in and make their movie for a low budget. And that's awesome that there was a vehicle for people to do that. Uh, but now it's got to the point where it almost feels like either Jason Blum or somebody very high up is like the Kevin Feige of this universe. And all the movies are starting to feel like they're co-directed by Jason Blum. And the Blumhouse template is not a good template because it's the very cliche and, and very generic jump scares. Uh, it's the the apparition hidden in the shadows that is kind of creepy visually the first time that you see it, but when they use that exact same visual four or five more times in the movie, it ceases to remain that way. The way that the movie is very intentionally on that hard line of being a PG-13 horror while certainly touching on a lot of aspects that could go rated R and more adult and inevitably more interesting, but won't because more money, more box office, more asses in seats. These are all things that are starting to feel like what you can expect from a Blumhouse horror film. And I, I just, I don't think that's a good look. I think that here very recently, I mean, you look back as far as Halloween ends, which I appreciate more than, than most people, but it's Halloween ends, very controversial movie. You follow that up with things like Insidious the Red Door, which I was really disappointed in. You have Exorcist Believer that was in my bottom 10 of last year. You had Night Swim just a couple of months ago. All of these movies are having some of the same problems. And whenever horror starts to feel templated, it inevitably feels boring because everything that's supposed to excite you and get emotions out of you and get a reaction out of you uh, with what you're seeing on screen, you're, you're ceasing to react to it. You're ceasing to have the emotional response to it that the movie intends for you to have. And so it leads a movie like Imaginary to be inevitably a bit boring and feel like it's dragging throughout most of the runtime because you kind of see all of the things coming. You already know the bag of tricks that they're working with. And it, it just leads to a film that doesn't make any impact on you. If you have experience with watching horror films more than 
once a decade. So all in all, guys, there was potential for this movie. I, I don't know if it's going to make a profit or not. There's potential for them to do better with a sequel if they do decide to go that route. But for me, I was massively disappointed in the script. I felt like the execution of these characters was extremely off. And by the end of it, I just I wanted it to be over. I wasn't miserable, but I was like, I'm done. I already see what you have in store for me. And there's just nothing here that merits me me seeing this. Well, that's it for this one, guys. If you enjoyed that, please click over here for all of my 2024 movie reviews so far. I'm also going to put my review of Night Swim up here if you want to check out the last Blumhouse release that I discussed. Like, share, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss everything in the future. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.